I've treated hundreds of patients and trained thousands of healthcare professionals over my 15 year career. And one thing I've learned through that experience is that most people are really confused about supplements or they lack a clear strategy or plan for how to use supplements to improve their health. That's why I created Adapt Naturals. It's a supplement line designed to add back in what the modern world has squeezed out and help you feel and perform your best. Our ancestors' diets were rich in the essential vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients we need for optimal function. But today, thanks to declining soil quality, a growing toxic burden, and other challenges in the modern world, most of us are not getting enough of these critical nutrients. I formulated Adapt Naturals using the principles of evolutionary biology and modern research to fill the nutrient gaps that we face today and replicate the nutrient intakes found in an optimal ancestral diet. Our flagship offering is called the Core Plus Bundle, a daily stack of five products that gives you everything you need each day, from essential vitamins and minerals like B12, folate, magnesium, and vitamin D, to phytonutrients like bioflavonoids, carotenoids, and beta-glucans. You can also order the products in the bundle separately if that works better for your needs. The Adapt Naturals products are made from the highest quality, food-based, or bioidentical ingredients, from cellular and immune health, to brain and nervous system support, to blood sugar and heart health, we've got you covered. Your supplement cupboard is about to get a lot smaller. We also created an app called Core Reset to help you get your nutrition, sleep, movement, and stress management dialed in. Because no matter how good our supplements are, and they are really good, you can't supplement yourself out of a bad diet and lifestyle. The best part is that you get this app at no additional cost when you order the Core Plus bundle. Head over to adaptnaturals.com, that's A-D-A-P-T naturals.com, to learn more and start feeling and performing your best. Hey everybody, this is Chris Kresser. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. On a recent episode, I interviewed Dr. Joanna Moncrief, who is an expert in depression and has spent the last couple decades debunking the myth that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance or a deficiency of serotonin, which it turns out was largely a marketing campaign created by pharmaceutical companies to sell more antidepressant drugs. She has also highlighted the overwhelming body of research suggesting that antidepressants are no more effective than placebo in the vast majority of cases. And in that interview, we, we talked extensively about uh, the research supporting both of those positions and why those ideas have not taken root, why it's still commonly believed that depression is caused by a chemical imbalance and that antidepressants are effective on average. At the end of that episode, I mentioned that I would soon be speaking with Dr. Mark Horowitz about how to safely taper off of antidepressant drugs for people who, in conjunction with their clinician, decide that they want to do that. It turns out that this is not as easy as it is as people are led to believe it is, and most people are not given adequate informed consent about how difficult it can be to get off of these drugs when they're originally prescribed them. So I'm really excited to share this information with all of you because I think it's absolutely critical for people to know about if they're considering starting these drugs or if they're already taking them and they're considering getting off of them. Dr. Mark Horowitz is an MD and PhD and he's a clinical research fellow in psychiatry at the National Health Service in England and an honorary clinical research fellow at University College London. He has a PhD from King's College London in the neurobiology of depression and antidepressant action. And he runs a clinic in the public health system which helps people to stop antidepressants and other psychiatric drugs. He's also a co-author on the recent Royal College of Psychiatry guidance on stopping antidepressants and his work informed the recent national guidelines on how to safely stop psychiatric medications. So I can't think of a better person to speak to about this, and I think this podcast will really complement the one I did with Dr. Moncrief recently. I would suggest listening to that one first, if you haven't already, or at least listening to it shortly after you listen to this, because it provides some important context on these topics. And I want to point out again that I realize some of the information that I covered with Dr. Moncrief and the information in this podcast may be uh, 
uh, may challenge some existing beliefs for folks who are listening, particularly if you are currently taking antidepressant drugs or you have taken them for a long period of time. And my intention here is, is to offer support and informed consent, again, which means just helping you to understand what the research and data really say, not what the pharmaceutical companies want us to believe, but what uh, practicing scientists believe based on the overwhelming body of evidence uh, that now exists on these topics, and what real qualified clinicians, psychiatrists like Dr. Horowitz are seeing in their work uh, supporting people in getting off of these medications, because it turns out that the average GP or an even average psychiatrist is not typically informed about uh, how to successfully taper off these drugs. And that's usually no fault of the individuals themselves, but it's that the organizations that publish these guidelines are not issuing the correct guidance. And so uh, the average community physician is simply not aware of uh, how this needs to be done in order for it to be safe. So I'm hopeful that this podcast uh, will help to spread this message, both for clinicians and patients taking these medications. So without further ado, let's dive in. Dr. Mark Horowitz, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Thanks for having me on. So we're going to talk all about um, antidepressants and particularly the process of tapering off of them if, some, if someone in conjunction with their prescribing clinician decides to get off of these medications. Uh, before we dive into that, I always like to learn a little bit about uh, the backstory of my guests. So um, you are a psychiatrist, and I presume you know earlier on in your career and still to this day are using these medications with some patients. But at some point, obviously, you became aware of the difficulty in some cases of, of getting off of these medications and how carefully it needs to be done. So I'm, ju I'm just curious to learn a little bit more about how you became interested in this topic and, and developed expertise here. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how I came to this. So look, I guess I'm a, I'm a neurotic Jewish person. So uh, I'm a, if you've seen Woody Allen films, you'll understand what my family was like. So very, very early on in, in things, I uh, actually started using an antidepressant when I was 21. I was in third year medical school uh, and I went to see my GP and I was put on an antidepressant. Uh, it's part of why I ended up going into psychiatry, you know, like in the cliche, I was trying to fix myself and my family. So I was always interested in that, in that area. And I was taught about antidepressants like everyone else in medical school and, and my training. And I thought, you know, it was, I thought they were useful medications. I actually moved from my uh, home in Australia to London to do a PhD in how antidepressants work with the idea, you know, these are useful drugs, but we need to understand them better to work out, you know, other ways to make drugs more effective. I was very interested in the inflammatory theory of depression and how antidepressants might fit into that. That's what I did four years of research in. The, the sort of turning point in things for me was at the end of my PhD, I read a academic paper about withdrawal symptoms from antidepressants. And I found that to be quite a shocking read. Uh, I had never been told about that issue with antidepressants in any of my training, any of my lectures. Um, and I, I had the understanding that drugs that cause withdrawal, number one, they're drugs that wear off over time because tolerance and withdrawal are mirror images of one another. And two, drugs that cause withdrawal like Valium or OxyContin, other opioids, aren't generally good for you to take long term. So I found that quite startling. And I tried to come off the drugs myself. Uh, I was on an antidepressant then, Lexapro or Escitalopram. I've been on the drug for 16 years at that point. And uh, it led to the, the absolute worst experience of my life. I had trouble sleeping. Uh, I had panic attacks that lasted for 10 or 12 hours of the day. I spent most of the day in a, in a state of, of panic and terror. Uh, I took up running and I ran 10 kilometers a day just to get a bit of relief from the whole process. And I ran until my, my feet bled. Uh, a few weeks into that, I thought about killing myself. None of that had been anything like what I'd gone on the drugs for. I'd gone on as a neurotic, slightly pessimistic 
unhappy young man. I'd never had panic attacks or trouble sleeping or had anything like what I, I experienced when I came off. So it was a very uh, jolting experience for me. Uh, I ended up going back on the drugs, even to a higher dose, and being too nervous to come off for a few years after that. That woke me up to what I had been told in my medical training, in my PhD, on, about these drugs didn't match the reality of them. Because a lot of the experts in my field who I studied with at, at my, in my PhD said it was easier to stop these drugs. There was a couple of weeks of discontinuation symptoms, uh, a euphemism put about by drug companies. You know, it wasn't a big deal to come off them. My experience was anything but that. And for a while, I thought it must just be me. But I soon found in online forums that there were dozens then hundreds then thousands and eventually tens of thousands of people going through a similar experience. And I guess it was that, it was that experience of finding out that these drugs were very different in reality to what I had been taught that set me, I guess, off on a bit of a journey to understand uh, how did that come about? What are these drugs really doing? Uh, what else uh, had I been told that wasn't quite accurate? And I guess that's led to me studying how to safely stop these drugs over the last few years and setting up a clinic in the National Health Service in England that helps people to stop antidepressants and reappraising a lot of what I've been taught previously. Thanks for that background. It's really helpful. And I imagine for your patients and even in your writing, it's helpful for you to have your own personal experience of, of this. So you know what it's like to try to get off of these drugs you know what it's like when it's done improperly and you know what it's like from your own experience and also your work with patients when it's done properly. Yeah, ex exactly, exactly. It's a whole different story when you're reading academic papers as to when you're on the receiving end of these things. So I've a lot from my own experience and a lot through uh, my experience with, with, with patients as well. Exactly. Great. So let's talk a little bit about why it's difficult to get off of these drugs. And you mentioned that um, tolerance and the difficulty in, in tapering off of these drugs is kind of two sides of the same street. So t tell us a little bit about what changes these drugs make in the brain and why that makes it difficult to, you know, st and completely inadvisable to just stop them cold turkey or even to stop them over a period of one or two weeks. Yeah, exactly. Great question. So look out. The, the principle of homeostasis is what guides our, our bodies and our brains, which is the drive for everything to be in the middle. So when it's too hot outside, we sweat. When it's too cold outside, we shiver to try to get us back into the middle. And that, that, is, the, that is the overarching principle of everything in our body. So when a drug causes an, ab an, abnorm an abnormally high level of a chemical, our body will adapt to go back to the middle. So when you take an antidepressant that increases serotonin, like a lot of them do, the body will experience that as too much serotonin because we now know, you know there is no deficiency of serotonin in depressed people. So what the drugs are causing is an, is an unusually high level of serotonin. As a result, the body will become less sensitive to serotonin in the same way as for caffeine. Caffeine, the body will become less sensitive to caffeine over time because it also adapts to, to caffeine as it does to antidepressants. And what that does is produce tolerance to the drug. So just like caffeine wears off, if you use it every day, so do antidepressants, whatever effects they have to start with become less and less as the body adapts to, those, uh, to the drug. We can see from neuroimaging of the brain that serotonin receptors in the brain will become less sensitive to serotonin in just a few weeks uh, of using an antidepressant. Now, so that produces tolerance when you're on the drug, so the drug has less and less effect. In America, you guys have a colorful phrase for that, poop out, which we don't have in England. We're much too pompous to use something like that, but, <laughs> but that's, that's describing the process. Crass Americans, leave it to us. No, straight speaking yeah. Americans, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, so poop out you know, is, the, is a non-medical term for tolerance. Uh, once you have tolerance to a drug, it means your brain and body is used to that drug. And when you stop it, you'll get withdrawal symptoms. The same is true for caffeine and for other drugs like benzodiazepines or even opioids. 
Just what's make interesting one is, you could, yeah, you I was going to say that it's also even true for substances that we produce endogenously, like insulin, right? If you follow, you know, eat a standard American diet, which is another one of our gifts to the world, <laughs> and your body's pumping out insulin too much, the cells become resistant to insulin, and that condition develops, which is, of course, uh, a major public health issue. So it's fascinating yeah. that this, this can happen in, in both of those contexts. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's interesting. And I'll just make one more point, which is sometimes people mix this up with addiction, and that's slightly different. Because people say, you know, I'm not addicted to my antidepressant, and that's when you get withdrawal symptoms. And I think that's become a, a bit of a source of confusion in this area, because you're right, you don't technically get addicted to antidepressants. No one is injecting antidepressants or breaking into their neighbor's house to get more antidepressants. There's another term called physical dependence, which unfortunately has become mixed up with addiction, but it's different. Physical dependence is what happens, um, you know, if you use a drug long-term, you adapt to it, as you would for caffeine, and antidepressants definitely cause physical dependence, and it doesn't require, you know, craving a drug or compulsion or the things that you see in addiction, but once you're physically dependent on a drug, when you stop it, you'll get withdrawal symptoms. So, so when you stop an antidepressant, your body basically misses the drug like it would miss other things. And withdrawal symptoms will then last for as long as it takes the brain and body to get reaccustomed to the drug not being there. So this is another point of confusion. People say, well, you know, they hear about withdrawal symptoms that can last months or longer. And everyone finds that a bit strange because the drug leaves your body in a few days or at most a few weeks. So how can withdrawal symptoms last so long? And it's because the changes to the brain caused by being on the drug can actually take months or years to resolve. You know, the brain doesn't just snap back into how it was before the drug. It takes a lot longer for things to readapt. And again, we can see that in neuroimaging. There are people who have been off antidepressants for months or years, and we can still see in their brains that their sensitivity to serotonin is changed, is, is reduced. And that's why we think that withdrawal symptoms, antidepressants can last for months or years and not just the few weeks it takes the drug to leave your system. Uh, yeah, I've definitely seen that anecdotally in my own practice with patients. Um, and I'm curious if, if this is what you've observed or if the research supports this, but again, anecdotally in my case, it seems to there seems to be a kind of direct relationship with the length of time that people have been on the drugs and the length of time that it can take to get off them or that those changes that you just mentioned persist. Is that an actual correlation that is seen in the research or that you've observed clinically, or does it vary based on other factors? So it's, it's a great question, and it's one I spend a lot of time looking at. The data is, the data is not very good. So we don't have a lot of information about what the risk factors are for withdrawal symptoms. But yes, exactly what you've said does come out a bit, that the longer you're on an antidepressant, the number one, the more likely you are to have withdrawal symptoms. Number two, the more likely they are to be severe symptoms. And then number three, a little bit, they're likely to last longer. And it makes sense because the longer you're on a drug, the more your brain gets used to the drug or adapts to the drug. And it makes sense it's going to cause more of a disruption when you stop it. So yes, in my clinical experience, I definitely see that. The people who people who are on drugs for just a few weeks or months, these antidepressants, tend not to have much trouble coming off. You know, it's it's we've done a little bit of research on this. You know, we think that about a quarter or a fifth of people who are on the drugs only for a few months will have trouble. But once you're on the drugs for more than a few years, then it becomes the majority of people have trouble coming on. They're more like fifty wow. of people. I, I I find that that is almost certainly underrepresented in the mainstream media and even in mainstream medicine. Like I, do you think that patients are getting informed consent about that when they're originally prescribed antidepressants? Has any work been done on that topic? I don't, I don't think that any patient has ever received informed consent for antidepressants as far as I'm concerned. The double blind randomized controlled trials of people stopping antidepressants conducted by drug companies shows that 54% of people will have withdrawal symptoms when they stop it. 
a lot of those studies are short term, only go for a few weeks. The longer people are on antidepressants, the, the harder it is to come off. Uh, in surveys, about one in four people will have severe withdrawal symptoms. Uh, we did some surveys of patients in the national health system in England, and we found that up to 40% of people were stuck on their drugs because they couldn't come off them, although they wanted to come off them. So I don't think anybody is being told that they may not be able to stop antidepressants if they start them because they can be so difficult to come off, that they have a one in two chance of having trouble stopping it and a one in four chance of having serious trouble stopping it. So I think that for years, the information that's been given to doctors and to patients has underestimated the risks of these drugs in a very pronounced way. The drug companies used a pretty neat trick, which was they did studies on people who had been on the antidepressants for eight weeks. And when people on antidepressants for eight weeks stop antidepressants, mostly they get mild and brief symptoms. That's true. But most people out in America and Europe and everywhere else ha have not been on the drugs for eight weeks. They've been on them for months or years or in some cases, decades. And so data that's, that's true for people on the drugs for eight weeks when they stop them is not at all relevant to people who are on the drugs for 10 years. And so drug companies have put out in paper after paper and uh, in, in statement after statement, uh, withdrawal symptoms, or often they call them discontinuation symptoms, a euphemism, are mostly mild and brief. And that is true if you use the drugs for eight weeks, and it's not true at all if you use the drugs for a lot longer. So doctors and patients have been systematically misinformed about the risks of these drugs, absolutely. Uh, that seems like, an. of course, we can't know, we can't get into the heads of these uh, pharmaceutical companies, but to me that seems like an intentional deception uh, when they're well aware of the fact that most people are taking these drugs for much longer periods than the eight weeks uh, th that these study periods last. And as you mentioned, it does, even despite that, there's still over 50% of patients are experiencing some symptoms on withdrawals, even if those are mild symptoms. This leads to another question, which is uh, an issue not just with antidepressants and side effects, but uh, also with many other medications. Let's imagine a scenario where someone who has depression, they go to their doctor, they are prescribed an antidepressant, they take the drug, and then they start decide to stop taking it, and they get a bunch of symptoms of antidepressant withdrawal. I, I imagine that some of those symptoms, if not the majority of them, are very similar to the original symptoms of depression that they were complaining about in the first place. So, how, I mean, that seems to make it even more difficult to study this and even more difficult for doctors to recognize that there might be an issue with these drugs. Yeah, you, you put your finger right on the central issue, Chris, which is that withdrawal symptoms can be easily mistaken for a return of someone's underlying issue if, if you're not well informed about what's going on. So, you know, serotonin affects, serotonin and the other chemicals affected by antidepressants affect, you know, almost every organ system in the body, the brain, the gut, the hormonal system, the bone marrow, everything is affected by these drugs. And when you stop them, you get symptoms that relate to all those different systems. And there are two broad categories of withdrawal symptoms people get, physical symptoms and psychological symptoms. And it's the psychological symptoms that cause the real confusion. So just like you've said, uh, withdrawal symptoms can include depressed mood, anxiety, tearfulness, crying, panic, suicidality, all sorts of psychological symptoms. We know that those are withdrawal symptoms because they, they can occur even in people who are put on antidepressants for reasons other than mental health problems. So for example, in studies of people who've been put on antidepressants for pain or for the menopause, when they stop antidepressants, they can get all of those symptoms, some of which they've never experienced before. So we know that all of those symptoms are withdrawal effects. And exactly as, as you say, uh, if you pitch up to your GP or primary care physician with these symptoms after stopping an antidepressant, you know, often in a few seconds, they'll tell you, well, you know, it must be your original problem coming back, your depression or your anxiety 
you better go back on the tablets. And in fact, this shows that you need those drugs because when you stop it, you turn into a basket case. Right. There are a few things that can help doctors distinguish those symptoms or patients as well from the underlying condition. I'll just say them briefly. Number one is withdrawal symptoms come on soon after stopping. So if you reduce or stop a drug and a couple of days later you feel awful and you have these symptoms, it's much more likely to be withdrawal symptoms than your original condition coming back because normally it takes weeks or months for people to uh, develop depression or anxiety again. Number two is the presence of other symptoms. So there are lots of physical symptoms from withdrawal, things like dizziness, headache, a feeling that things are not quite real, which is sort of called, uh, uh, called depersonalization or derealization. There are quite specific sensory symptoms people can get, like little electric zaps in their head, uh, where they feel like their brain's been switched off for a second or little zaps gone through, uh, which is a very distinctive symptom of withdrawal. Uh, there are gut problems, diarrhea, constipation, uh, nausea. Uh, some people get flu-like symptoms. So there are, there are a whole lot of, when those symptoms come along with the anxious mood or depressed mood, it's a clue that this is not a relapse. This is a physical condition. Uh, another thing to watch out for is, even if it's mostly psychological symptoms, if these are very different from what people originally had, we should think withdrawal. So for example, if someone was put on an antidepressant because they were depressed and lethargic, and now when they stop an antidepressant, they're very anxious, they're having panic attacks and they can't sleep, it's much more likely that they've developed quite common withdrawal symptoms rather than coincidentally developed a new mental health disorder just at the moment they stopped an antidepressant. You know, that doesn't, that's very unlikely to happen. Uh, but withdrawal symptoms are quite likely. And the last thing, more helpful in retrospect is if they go back on an antidepressant, symptoms generally go away in a few days, whereas they would take longer if it was a mental health issue. Uh, and so those things can help people to distinguish between withdrawal effects and their original condition coming back. But it's not always simple. That's extremely helpful. Uh, I imagine it's, you know, for people listening to this, it's going to be really valuable to have ways of distinguishing between, you know, what might be normal symptoms that they historically or typically experience and symptoms that are more related to um, tapering off of the drugs. So let's, let's shift gears now and, and talk a little bit about tapering. Um, before we get into the best way to do it, uh, I'd love to hear about what you typically do see, um, not in your own practice, of course, or in, in with other colleagues that are in, informed about this issue, but what would you say is sort of the default right now um, for, for tapering off of these drugs? And, you know, has that changed over the last several years as, as you know, uh, as a result of your work and, and, and your colleagues trying to shed more light on the importance of tapering off of these drugs more slowly and in, in, in the hyperbolic uh, way that you're going to discuss? It's a really good question. And I can answer that question with confidence because we surveyed 1,400 patients who had come off antidepressants and asked them, what do their doctors tell them to do? So uh, the most common approach is to stop people's antidepressants over four weeks or eight weeks. And that normally involves uh, telling patients to uh, reduce their drug to a half for two weeks or four weeks, and then down to a quarter of their dose for two weeks or four weeks, and often by taking a half a dose every second day. So that's that's the most common thing that people will get told by their doctors. Halve, halve the tablet, do that for a little while, then, then halve the tablet and take it every second day uh, and do that for a while and then stop it. So that's the that's the most common uh, process at the moment. I can tell you the, the reason why we surveyed those 1,400 people was because they had all give, been given that advice. They'd all had a terrible time. They'd experienced horrible withdrawal symptoms. They had gone back to their doctor who told them that if they had terrible symptoms, it must mean they need their antidepressant. They've experienced relapse. In fact, they may need to be on the drug lifelong. They should get back on it. And all of these patients had thought that doesn't make any sense because I never had some of these symptoms before. I feel dizzy. I have a headache. I've got electric zaps. How can this be depression? And they'd all lost faith in their doctors. 
and they had in instead turned to peer support websites, Facebook sites, a site called Surviving Antidepressants, where they'd gone to get more advice. And there's now a couple of hundred thousand people on such websites. So this is not a not an isolated problem. And a lot of people get into a lot of trouble this way. If you've listened to this show for a while, you know that I'm a super active guy. Depending on the time of year, I'm either skiing, mountain biking, hiking, backpacking, surfing, or lifting weights on most days of the week. I also live in a really dry climate at high elevation. For these reasons, I pay a lot of attention to hydration. I've learned the hard way what happens when I get dehydrated, and I know how important hydration is to overall health. But hydration isn't just about drinking water. It's about water plus electrolytes. This is where Element comes in. It's a combination of electrolytes like sodium, potassium, and magnesium in easy-to-use individual packets that you just add right to your water bottle. And unlike most electrolyte products on the market, Element is free of sugar and artificial junk. I drink Element every day, and it's made a huge difference in how I feel. Even with my training and profession, I don't think I realized how often I was dehydrated before I made Element part of my daily routine. If you'd like to try it, the folks at Element have an exclusive offer for my podcast listeners. You can get a free sample pack with one of each of the eight flavors Element sells when you purchase any Element product. This is perfect for anyone who wants to try all of the flavors or who wants to introduce a friend to Element. Just go to cresser.co slash element, that's L-M-N-T, to place an order and take advantage of this offer. What, what do you see as the root of the, of the problem here? Because, you know, I, I generally tend to think that most doctors are doing their best in most cases and are trying genuinely, you know, want to help their patients. And I imagine you agree with that. So is, is it a problem with the, the organizations that are tasked with issuing the guidance to the physicians or, you know, where, where is this breakdown occurring? Sure. So I completely agree with you. A lot of my friends are GPs and psychiatrists. They're all wanting to do well for their patients. There's no, no malice there at all. It simply comes down to what the guidelines are telling them to do. So uh, I know the story a bit better in England, but I, I know it vaguely in America as well. The guidelines have said the same thing for the last few years. They've said you can stop antidepressants over several weeks. Most withdrawal symptoms are mild and brief. So if you're a doctor being taught that, as I was, you see people coming in, they've got incredibly severe symptoms of withdrawal. Uh, you know, there are some people are suicidal, as I was coming off the drug. You look in your guideline, it says mild and brief symptoms of withdrawal. It can't be this that's walked into my door, you know, in hysterics. It must be something else. It must be a mental health condition coming back or something like that. And, and because I've followed the guidelines, which say to a stop over a few weeks. So if people are having a problem, it must be about something about them, something about their mental health conditions. And so I think yeah, doctors are poorly informed. I think those guidelines, you asked have things been updated in America, the guidelines are still the same as they were 10 years ago. They say you can stop over several weeks. It has a slight clause. Some people may need longer, but it doesn't tell you who, it doesn't tell you how much longer or how to do it. And I think that there's been, you know, I don't know if, it, I don't think there's malice in the guideline committees either. I think there's just been very little interest in this. Not many studies have been done on how to stop antidepressants. So for example, on starting antidepressants, there's about a thousand studies. On stopping them, there's about a dozen. And that's because most of the studies are sponsored by drug companies who are interested in marketing their products. They clearly have much more interest in starting and stopping these drugs. Uh, it's been, it's been, there hasn't been attention paid to this. Uh, and that's why I think we've ended up in the mess that we're in. Yes. Uh, <laughs> there's a couple acronyms which come to mind here, which is FTM and WNL. FTM is follow the money and WNL is we're not looking. And those often go together, right? For the reason that you just said, there's very little financial incentive for pharmaceutical companies to sponsor studies on what happens when the drugs are stopped. There are all the incentives in the world for them to uh, do studies on why to start the drugs. And that, you know, that's a whole other conversation, of course, uh, uh, but something that absolutely is, is, you know, the system is set up in such a way that that kind of behavior is rewarded. So that's a problem that we're going to have to address at some point, which is outside of the scope of this conversation, but certainly worth noting, as you did. Let's talk now about the correct way to do this. You talk uh, 
about hyperbolic tapering. So uh, tell us what that is and, and you know, maybe paint a picture of what a proper tapering process might look like for people. Um, you know, let, let's say, let's take a couple hypothetical, or, or let's start with a hypothetical person who's been on these drugs for, for 10 years. I don't think that's unusual at this point. So, you know, someone who's been on one of the SSRIs for 10 years, how would you approach it with them? I'll walk you through what I would do the patient in my clinic, how to come off the drug safely. So I see a lot of people who are on the drugs, as you say, for 10 years. In America, the average, the average person, so half of people on antidepressants in America have been on them for more than five years, and it's heading towards 10 years. So there's one in four people on antidepressants in America, adults, one in four adults, and half of them have been on it for more than five years. So you're talking about a very common person. I won't go through now, although I can, all the different things I talk about about people uh, with people about what they think about their antidepressants, what role they think antidepressants play in their lives, what role a chemical imbalance does, how they perceive themselves. Let's say we've got to the bit where they want to come off the antidepressant. I'll walk through what what I what I do. There are really three broad principles to coming off antidepressants. Number one is doing it slowly. So slowly generally means over months and sometimes more than a year. Some people will need even longer than that. And that's to give the brain and body enough time to adapt to there being less drug around. You know, and that's a lot slower than the weeks that people are normally told to do. The second thing is people need to go at a pace that they can tolerate. I've, I've already, I've done some work on what are the risk factors for withdrawal symptoms. And there's a few things we know. Uh, there are some drugs that are worse than others. Drugs like Effexor or Venlafaxine, Cymbalta or Geloxetine metazapine uh, and paroxetine they're the drugs that cause people the most trouble although although almost any antidepressant can cause people issues the longer you've been on it the worse the trouble can be in stopping it the higher the dose has some role and if you've had a really hard time in the past coming off the drugs that also gives you an idea about what's going to happen when you try it again but uh, it's it's somewhat difficult to just look at somebody and work out how difficult the process will be We've worked out a kind of risk calculator that's a bit of an estimate to start with things. But really the key thing is how does someone experience a test reduction? You know, making a small reduction, what does that do to the person? And based on that, you can modify things so that people can go at a rate that they can tolerate. Some people are, you know, have three children and two jobs. They can't tolerate a whole lot of withdrawal symptoms. Some people have a bit more flexibility and can go a little bit quicker and everyone's a bit different. And the last thing is this hyperbolic method of tapering, uh, which, which, which is a bit of jargon that I'll just explain. The key thing about antidepressants is they don't affect the brain in a linear way. What they do is very small doses of antidepressants have an outsized effect on the brain. This is because when there's not much drug around in the brain, all the receptors that the drug attaches to are open for business, unsaturated. Uh, and so every extra milligram of drug has a very large effect. And when a lot of those receptors are full of drug, which is what happens at the higher doses that people use in clinical practice, every extra milligram of drug has less and less additional effect. It's sort of like the law of diminishing returns. So uh, a few milligrams around, the effect on the brain is very steep. At higher doses, it flattens out, and that produces a hyperbola, which if you can cast your mind back to the darkness of high school mathematics, kind of a curve that goes up very steeply and flattens out, like the beginning of an M, and then it goes uh, flat at the top. And that tells us something about what happens when you reduce your dose of drug. So most doctors are using what I call a linear approach, that that Harvard and then Harvard again is, is really a linear approach to reducing. And what happens is you're sort of walking down this curve and to start off with, it's very shallow. So you make a reduction at a higher dose and it doesn't cause people very much trouble. So going from say 20 milligrams is a very common dose for a lot of antidepressants to 10 milligrams doesn't cause people huge trouble. But when you go from... 10 milligrams to five milligrams, you're now in the steeper part of the curve and it can cause 
a bigger change in effect on the brain, which can cause more withdrawal symptoms for people. And then the final five milligrams is a cliff. It's almost, it's almost a straight line going down. And when people go from five milligrams to zero milligrams, which sounds like the same as going from 10 to five, actually involves a huge change in effect on the brain. And that can cause a lot of withdrawal symptoms for people. And that's what people tell me. The first few reductions were fine. The last few milligrams were excruciating. Uh, and that's what they've been told to do by their doctors. The doctors haven't seen this relationship. That relationship that I described has only been revealed by imaging of the brain, people on antidepressants using radioactive nucleotides. And if you don't understand that, then it doesn't make sense why someone has no, has, has no trouble going from 10 milligrams to five milligrams but has huge trouble going from five to zero, you might think they must need the last few milligrams. But what hyperbolic tapering involves is basically following the contour of that relationship. You go slower and slower as you get down to lower doses. So when the curve becomes steep, you inch down like climbing down a cliff very slowly. So does that require, I know like with benzodiazepine tapering, um, Often it requires, you know, either special compounding pharmacy to get those small incremental doses, or even sometimes shifting from a drug with a shorter half life to one with a longer half life. Does that does does that come into play with SSRIs? Or does a clinician need to work with a compounding pharmacy, or how, how does that work in, in practice? Yeah, you've you've again you've seen the, the major barrier that's exactly the question i always get asked here so how do you do that because this requires going down to much smaller doses than are commonly available in the tablets at the store uh, there's two main ways to do this one is you can get the drugs compounded as you say made into smaller doses there's actually a lot of liquid versions of these drugs available so the manufacturers uh, have made some of the drugs into liquid form often to give to children or to people that can't swallow, but they're very useful to be able to make these smaller reductions. Some drugs don't come in liquids and people have to find other ways. There's a couple of options. Some drugs come as beads in a capsule that can't be turned into liquids and people will open up capsules and count out beads in order to make small reductions. This is particularly true for Effexor and uh, Cymbalta. And that's a perfectly reasonable way to do things as long as you put the beads back in another capsule so it doesn't hurt your throat. And then another option is a lot of these tablets can be crushed and mixed with water, which is a perfectly acceptable uh, way to use the drugs. In, in, in England, uh, the National Health Service explains to mothers how to crush up these tablets and make suspensions in liquids to be able to give drugs to children. So it's a, it's a reasonable uh, option for doctors and patients to do it. It's an off-label use of the drugs, which means it's not approved by the manufacturers. But a lot of the ways we use drugs in clinical practice is off-label. And so the simplest option out of all those is to use a liquid made by the manufacturer, but it's a variety of options. And that's the way that people can make smaller doses and go down bit by bit. That's helpful. I know that question comes up and, and will come up uh, for people who are listening to this, both clinicians and patients. Uh, that did lead me to another question, though, which we haven't discussed yet, and that is, are there significant variations in, number one, how difficult it is to taper, and number two, exactly how to taper with the different categories of antidepressants, like SSRIs, SNRIs, um, some of the older tricyclics and you know the different types of medications that or the, even the antipsychotics I don't know if they fit into this category but uh, as you know better than anyone there people are taking a variety of medications and are prescribed medications for depression um, from all different classes depending on what works best for them so um, yeah or, uh, does that is that germane to this discussion yes so I'll say a few things about that so one Yes, every individual is a bit different. As I say, probably the drug they're on, the dose, how long they've been taking it for influences things. Um, but really, you have to individualize a tapering regime to, 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 to a specific person. You can't just take it out of a book. These are the 10 doses to go at. I'm actually writing a textbook that has some suggestions 
but it's got to be modified for the person. So the best way to work it out is, are they going at a rate that causes them tolerable withdrawal symptoms? Everyone will probably get a few withdrawal symptoms. It's hard to avoid completely, but it shouldn't be so that they're hanging on, you know, white knuckling it as I, as I did when I came off it very quickly. People want to be able to, you got to have a rate that people can tolerate. The principles are actually very similar for different classes of drugs. So you've mentioned a few different subclasses of antidepressants. The approach for an SSRI or an SSRI or a different class of antidepressant is generally similar because that hyperbolic curve I described is actually true for all psychiatric drugs and all of their different receptors. It, it comes about because of a thing called the law of mass action, which I described, which is as you have more and more drug about, more and more receptors are filled up. And so the drug has less and less effect. So that relationship actually applies for all the classes of antidepressants around. Uh, and so that approach of going slowly at a rate someone can tolerate and down by smaller and smaller amounts at lower doses applies to all drugs. It actually applies to all psychiatric drugs. So antipsychotics you know, is, a, is a separate class of drugs. They do tend to affect different receptors. You know, they tend to affect dopamine often rather than serotonin. But the same relationship applies and the same overarching principles also apply. So I worked on a trial in England that was taking people off antipsychotics and we, we used the exact same approach, going at a rate they can tolerate, pausing if they have unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, waiting for them to stabilise and going down by smaller and smaller amounts at lower doses. So that's, that's, and that's, that also applies to benzodiazepines, to drugs like Lyrica, Regabalin, to sleeping tablets. It even applies to opioids. So we've done a, I've done some work on all those different classes of drugs, and all of these principles are the same for all of them. Some drugs in those classes will be harder than others. So in general, Effexor is harder than some of the other antidepressants, but the principles uh, apply. I'll just say two more things. So I realize I didn't answer one of your questions. You put in, you said that should people be swapped to a longer acting drug uh, in order to help them come off? That's quite useful in benzodiazepines. Valium is a drug people are often switched across to. In antidepressants, it's a lot more troublesome, I found. Um, I think it's because the drugs in the benzodiazepine class are really similar to one another. And the antidepressants are not quite as similar, even ones in the same class like SSRIs. So I have found that people switching across from an SSRI to Prozac or fluoxetine, which is the longest acting drug in that class, actually tend to have trouble with that more often than you would expect. And so I tend not to switch people across to longer acting drug, although there is, there is some rationale for that. It should be easy to come off a longer acting drug, but I haven't always found that that works. So it's not, that wouldn't be my first, like my go-to for most people. And then the second thing I wanted to say is people shouldn't skip doses every second day. So that's a very common way that doctors uh, advise patients to reduce. And they're, they're intuiting that going down to a smaller dose is helpful, but every second day dosing tends to make the, the levels in people's blood go up and down because most antidepressants have half-life of 24 hours. That is half of the drug is removed from the body every 24 hours. If you dose every 48 hours, it causes huge changes. And so that's not a very, it's not a very good way to make reductions. Yeah, that's really helpful to hear about those differences because I have seen that with Valium. It's often the final step in the benzo process for that reason, but it's good to know that that's not how it works uh, with, with these, this class of medications. So I want to I talk a little bit about one of the issues that's come up in my clinical practice. This is you know, not my area of expertise, and if I had a patient who is on antidepressant medications and they want to explore getting off of them, I will, of course, refer to a psychiatrist, and I'm trying, you know, I often w would like to refer to a psychiatrist that's in their area that, that understands everything that we've discussed in this show, but I frankly have found that to be uh, easier said than done, and I've found that there aren't a ton of GPs or even psychiatrists that are up to date on this, and maybe perhaps be, for the reason that you mentioned, because the guidelines that are issued still in most countries are not educating them properly about this topic. So how do you recommend 
that, you know, imagine someone's listening to this show and, and they uh, either would like to explore getting off these drugs with their clinician or they have already been trying to do that and they found that it's difficult because they're moving too quickly and they then have to keep going back on the drug. How would you recommend that they get support? Right. So it's a good question. It is a real dilemma that, that the people that should be most qualified to help people uh, are not knowledgeable about this area. I suggest a few things to people. Um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists in England have put out what I consider to be pretty good guidelines uh, about three years ago that I was involved in writing, really under a lot of pressure from the public to change the guidelines. Uh, and they, to their credit, they did. Uh, I sometimes get people to print out those guidelines to take it into their doctor to explain what they want to do. And because it's from a authoritative source, doctors will sometimes take that seriously. Uh, I've got a lot of academic papers on my website, including a paper that I wrote in the Lancet Psychiatry on why to stop antidepressants in the way that I've just described. Again, because it's from the Lancet Psychiatry, doctors tend to uh, take that seriously. You know, those those are those are the kind of tools that I would I would suggest people use to advocate for themselves to doctors. People will be aware there's all sorts of websites online. Uh, some of them have quite good advice. Some of them follow academic papers that I've written or other people have written, uh, and some of them are a bit hit and miss. Uh, but I think it's I think it's important that doctors uh, are are upskilled on this, so people are not uh, wandering through the internet to try to find out how to come off these drugs, and they can get advice from people that should be experts in it. And I do a lot of lecturing now. I'm invited to different places in America. Uh, to give to give lectures to different grand rounds. So I, I hope that this will increase in visibility and more and more people will be aware of it. Yeah, I, I really do too. It seems to me a glaring shortcoming. There's the, just the whole constellation here, how patients are not given informed consent to start with. So they get on these drugs with the mistaken assumption that it would be quite easy to stop them or they might have to deal with mild, you know, at, at worst, mild side effects that would be temporary. Uh, that, that's obviously where the problem begins, right? Because they were not able to make an informed decision in the first place. And then, for the, as you pointed out, the very people that they would tend to rely on for helping them to taper off of these drugs when it's time to do that are not properly educated on and, and not given the most recent up-to-date information from the scientific literature or experts who are doing this all day, every day um, in, in the clinic with patients. So it's, it's deeply concerning uh, that this is the state of affairs right now, but I hope that podcasts like this and other resources that are available online can, can help you know, shed some light on the topic and give people more tools for doing this. Along those lines, I know that you're working on another initiative to provide this kind of support to people, which is Outro. And I believe this is a, a digital clinic that you've set up in Canada to help people safely stop antidepressants and that this may also be coming to the U.S. later in the year. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that, that's exactly right. So you, you've, you've said it's, 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 um, it's deeply concerning, and I think that's an understatement. I mean, I think it's very worrying that there's... You know, there's 100 million people plus on antidepressants that most doctors don't know how to stop. You know, I think it's sort of the same as there being 100 million cars without brakes on the road. You know, it's people should know how to stop these drugs when they start them. It should be a part of medical training. You know, starting drugs is a part of medicine, of course. And I think the 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 other side of it should also be a part of it. I helped um, some Canadians to start Outro in part because I received so many emails from patients around the world asking me to help them come off their antidepressants because their doctors don't know how. I sort of thought this was a bit flabbergasting that they've often they'll get my paper and look at the email address to uh, email me to ask someone across the world to help them because their doctors don't know what they're doing. And so I essentially, what Outro does is what I do in my clinic in London. So I run a clinic in the public health system. I Actually, as exactly as you say, I give informed consent to people after they've been on the drugs for 10 years. I tell them what the actual benefits, what the risks are and how to come off them. You know, then I will develop a kind of personalized regime for each patient and monitor them and guide them through step by step as they come off and help them get through any difficulties. And we're doing the same thing 
in in outro it's a digital clinic it's run by psychiatrists and nurse practitioners and uh you know a big part of it actually is giving patients informed consent about what the drugs do and how to stop them safely uh sort of address their fears about the process we help them organize uh, compounded medication or liquid versions of drugs we get them to monitor themselves you can chat with a, a nurse they're a therapist to make the whole process uh, safer because it can be a bumpy process as i've learned firsthand so we're trying to make it you know easy to go through uh, the reason it's called outro is because there's lots of intros to these drugs but very few outros to help you come off at the moment it's 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 operating in british columbia in uh, Ontario, and we are hoping that later in the year we'll also open in America, uh, where actually where I get most emails from, because it's one of the most overly medicated countries in the world. Uh, and we hope that alongside educating doctors, uh, that this will provide a service that patients can use. And we hope also doctors will uh, will start to learn from it and and work with us so that we can scale up. Uh, help people to come off these drugs. Thank you so much, Dr. Horowitz, for this conversation. And thank you for the very important work that you have been doing and continue to do on this subject. I know you've already helped so many people um, come off of these drugs safely. And I hope that this um, interview will reach many people. Uh, as you said, it's these, these are very commonly prescribed medications. They're drugs that people are taking for years, if not decades, on average. And there's very little support right now out there for, for people who are taking these medications. So I'm looking forward to um, this conversation getting out there and people and outro becoming available in the United States so that uh, people can get the assistance they need when they get off these drugs. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. Okay, everybody, thanks for listening. Keep sending your questions to chriscresser.com slash podcast question. And as another reminder, I recorded a previous podcast with Dr. Joanna Moncrief about the myth of the chemical imbalance theory and the idea that low serotonin levels cause depression. And we also talked about a large body of evidence which suggests that antidepressants are not effective in, in most cases, according to the gold standard research that we have on this topic. So I hope uh, that you listen to that podcast um, as well, if you didn't get that already, because it's it's kind of provides a lot of important um, context and foundational uh, understanding for this show. So thanks again, Dr. Horowitz, and thanks everybody for listening. And that's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.